Hello, everyone. Hi, here's Renato Barra from Rebels AI. Let us maybe just wait another couple of minutes, uh, maybe a minute or so. Um, just for your information, this webinar will be recorded, so you will not miss any of the of, of the content which we will see here, and uh, all the participants would also be able to download the presentation which we are going to show today. Um, therefore, please feel free to to just uh, see the slides, enjoy the show, and hopefully it will be useful for you and you get some. Uh, very nice insights that you could use uh, in your day-to-day -day job uh, in the future. So we are already one minute in, so maybe uh, just waiting for my signal from from uh, my colleague Andrew, who is monitoring and helping, uh, helping me in the background, that we can start. Yeah, okay, so we can start. So hi again, my name is Renzo Zabaira, I'm one of the founders of Revos AI. And uh, we are going to speak about top five uh, metrics to predict customer churn or actually expansion. So we have prepared some tough agenda here uh, from the timeline. The webinar will be 30 minutes. Uh, so we have actually 29 left. We're going to go through some introduction, why customer health scoring. We'll go deeper into five specific metrics we prepared for you today, such an interesting metrics that you will see the pro and contra of each metric. And we'll also shortly highlight the challenges with traditional approach of customer health scoring and how modern companies are actually, what, what are the new ways, maybe innovative ways to solve these uh, challenges. Without further ado, so uh, as I said, my name is Renan Zabarov. I'm an uh, entrepreneur, engineer, puzzle of three people, and uh, basically located in Bonn, Germany. My colleagues are here located also in here in Germany, but also in Ukraine uh, right now. And uh, basically, before founding Rebus AI, I founded another company which uh, successfully exited last year. Uh, it was called, called Elastic AI, uh, Elastic IO. We were around about 50 people. And actually, the uh, experience that you're going to highlight and also the know how was collected over the last. Uh, uh, um, uh, several years, as I was actually also man managing the customer success teams in my previous company, and also we did a lot of um, um, interviews with customer success, uh, as well as sales and revenue operations people from a variety of different companies, and all of this insight together with over 200 comments uh, is uh, actually um, in this webinar, and we're going to show, highlight in this webinar. So. Um, you may ask your questions in the chat. So my colleague will also monitor the chat and make sure that the questions are um, uh, will be will be answered. Uh, I will try to also look in the chat and also interrupt uh, in case there will be some questions. Uh, so we are starting with a basic understanding of like customer health scoring. Why are we doing this and what is it about? So customer health scoring is more or less just a simple number. Uh, which is typically also color coded into the green, amber, and red to highlight the probability or likelihood of customers to grow, stay consistent, which will be like amber or yellow, or churn, it will be more like a red uh, color code. And uh, the customer health scoring is in a very foundation of customer success management because it actually gives a customer success managers a basis, a foundation for proactive actions to make sure that the time of a customer success or the time of an account manager is spent with accounts or customers which are really needed to prevent churn or increase and enhance and uh, expansion rather than with accounts or customers who just screaming the loudest. So this is a, like a very important part of of let's say um, state of the art customer success to make sure that we know where to go, we know to him speak to speak. And it's also very easy to grasp high level metric, which is important for communication upwards to the management of the company, uh, where usually the customer success people are reporting to either customer revenue, chief revenue officer or, or sales, and maybe sometimes to direct to CEO. 
And uh, this metrics also gives also a little bit of peace of mind understanding of uh, a state of the customers, which is definitely not only affected by an action of a customer success manager, but but broader sets of um, let's say broader sets of of uh, aspects like product, user experience, customer experience, support, and many many other aspects. Therefore, the customer health score is actually an aggregation of multiple, let's say, scores, usually, or I would say, or aggregation of multiple parameters from broader set of uh, systems or areas of customer journey. Um, therefore, it's usually calculated based on multiple KPIs or multiple metrics. And these metrics are aligned under one customer health score formula. Uh, based on the weighted average, for example, or some more complicated formulas we will see in future and uh, later um, of the uh, single value to really make it easy to grasp and understand. <clears throat> so we actually built a customer health score template you can actually download from our website. Uh, we will show the link later and also share it in the chat uh, with over 27 different KPIs of which could be relevant, which are relevant, which we saw people were collecting from the customer base in order to understand the customer health and predict the churn and expansion. But we just picked five top metrics, which we saw frequently in many different engagements, in many different discussions, uh, based and also based on the feedback, what people find useful and what's actually practically used uh, in bigger part of the health scoring formulas. And we start with activity metric, which is a very simple activity metric. Uh, it's not a bit encrypted. It's actually monthly active users, daily active users, or weekly active users. This is very basic uh, metric because it's actually um, uh, specific for, uh, let's say, customer um, um, software as a service products where majority of people control how frequently the users of the software as a service product engage with the solution, how frequently they are going online. And uh, the monthly active users means like how many users were active um, in, in a on a day, oh, sorry, on months, so at least once a month, or in some tools, it's actually three times a month. Daily active users is like how many people were active at least daily in the system. And weekly means like at least one times a week, a uh, user uh, logged in into the system and uh, tried to use or maybe use some of the functionality of the systems. These are very basic metrics because actually many SaaS and online tools are already controlling it. So this information is mostly available. And the pro, the advantages of this rule, of this of this metric is that it's easy to understand. You know, it's pretty logical. If my users do not log into my application anymore, then there is a high probability that they do not see any benefits out of it. However, um, here is also one of the contra, <laughs> the problem with this, because this kind of metric is not universal. Um, there are some products which are not useful every day, right? There are not some products which are maybe useful once a year uh, or actually once a quarter. And here you can see a nice um, a picture of, um, of uh, retention over frequency of usage per week of different kinds of B2C applications. So you can see like weather, for example, is very frequently used. So I'm using my weather app almost every day. Right, long looking on it on my, on my phone, or maybe opening up, proactively opening up. But uh, st music streaming, for example, or social games may not be this the same frequency and then they enjoy the same frequency. And this is the same also why uh, this um, a monthly active user, daily active user, weekly active users may not be universal for every application. You need to be very careful about it. And one way to address this pro problem is actually to. Uh, put it into relation of a license number of licenses seats or number of seats that are sold to a particular customer. If you have this metrics, it totally makes sense to divide number of monthly active users with a uh, number of seats which is sold to this particular customer to create to 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 come up with a 
with an easy to grasp, easy to understand license utilization metric, uh, which could be a, a good early indicator of uh, churn or um, expansion. And another advantage is definitely that um, majority of tools which are used to uh, bring analytics about product usage support this metric. So you can pick it up immediately from Pendo, or from Amplitude, or from Mixpanel, and many other tools, uh, which makes it definitely easier to use uh, in practice. And one thing to note here, two things, uh, basically two things to note here. The different roles and scenarios may be different. So we have seen many cases where a frequency of usage of power user significantly difference from different from from a frequency usage of non-power users of application so you need to be careful in analyzing it so not every monthly active users equal among each other and second the week first week or first month usage could be treated differently and maybe should be treated differently um, because this is like a, a very moment uh, once the user starts using our application, that will never repeat again. So basically, the the monthly Mao Dao Wow uh, would be uh, important to understand better. The second mostly used metrics is Net Promoter Score. Uh, I I believe you have seen it multiple times already. So this is like a questions: How likely you you would recommend the tool that you use to your friend or colleague? It's originally developed by a Bain company. It's actually cooperated by a Bain company. Uh, however, the, you will find a variety of different ways how to capture it usually. Uh, so for example, Pendo, I believe have built it in Mixpanel, uh, do not uh, to my best knowledge, but there are many, many tools to collect this data. Advantages are very obvious. It's very simple to understand and it's also universal. So actually you can ask independent of uh, what your software solution or a consulting offering uh, is giving if given to your customers you can ask if they would like to re if they can recommend it or not so you don't have to really spend time thinking about um, smart questions but just like ask the standard question <clears throat> and uh, this is also uh, basically very easy to to use and to start collecting um, as, a, as a KPI. However, you need to be very much aware about a statistical relevance. <clears throat> so for example, if you only have, I don't know, um, if you collect the NPS score um, for, for all users of your application, and I hope you have many users you could collect it from, then the statistical relevance of the data on a larger group of people would be good enough. However, if you speak, try to control the NPS score on account basis or on the customer basis, then you would definitely come to smaller numbers, which you need to aggregate and, and, and understand in the smaller numbers so that the statistical relevance or actually the realistic value of the data will be significantly lower. And second thing you need to take care and take keep in mind, who is actually answering this question? Sometimes, and we saw like an anecdotal evidences of it in some of our, 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 our uh, interview partners and also our customers, uh, that sometimes people who are not really relevant for, um, for this questionnaire actually answer this question. And um, obviously not everyone answering this question every time, so on, so on. So there there's, can be high variance on non-cohesive groups of customers caused by this. Um, and uh, therefore, you need to take care and understand not only like what is an NPS score, which is, by the way, not the average of the scores, but subtract detractor uh, promoters minus detractors. So it's actually an, uh, a, a number of people, so number of percentage of promoters and detractors, yeah, not the average score, but also how many responses you have. Moving on. The activation and triggers uh, closely relevant to the time to value. Uh, this is also one of the um, important uh, KPIs and important, uh, let's say, um, information sources for customer health scoring, which we see. And uh, this is um, typically um, implemented as a notification or a trigger when a customer of yours 
generate value out of your product or comes to so-called aha moment. For example, if we are we are presenting you now, uh, our, we are showing you a presentation uh, on a software called Pitch, uh, which is like an online PowerPoint. Um, and I spent a lot of time creating the, the, the presentation in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this in this application. However, my value event, which is actually where I generate value out of my presentation, is actually showing it to you. So this aha moment, this trigger event, is actually essential on my customer lifecycle journey. And the same is for most of the products and most of the services which you see out there, and which we also talk to, the activation event, or if we make it differently, time to value. So how much time a user spend investing of their time, of the company time, how much like the group of people investing into your application or into your service to generate the value. And this can be actually the, one of the best predictors of customer success and churn, of, of churn and expansion because of the um, uh, statistical correlation between time to value and churn is very, very strong. And uh, for some of applications, for example, for software service application can be collected automatically, which is clear advantages of it. However, what you also need to be careful and why you need to be careful, it's not universal, right? There's like not a single event for all applications, which you say like, okay, this is that. And, and, and then we have our time to value, but, um, but it's, you need to really be careful and understand uh, various users and various roles in the application, but also tracking on account level can be, can be challenging. So as I mentioned before, remember, some of the users are more like a power user. So there's like a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a dynamics in a user base, usually of applications, which are more complex. And there you need to be careful whom you actually track and what is an actual activation trigger there. Um, so again, if you have any questions, just post them in, in the chat. Uh, we'll be happy to, to come to them um, at the end of the presentation. We reserved actually uh, uh, some minutes for this. Um, and then, the next uh, number four, like of top metrics, is basically the support KPIs. Uh, there are various of support metrics you could collect if you are using a standardized or out of the box support and ticketing system like you know, Sendesk or Atlassian or many others. Um, and uh, these are, for example, number of open tickets. Uh, could be a useful metrics by the end of the period, either like weekly or monthly, to see what is a what is the number of open ticket for a particular customer for a particular account. Um, the second is the SLA violations, uh, as uh, many companies control for how long the tickets are open and how fast the reaction on tickets are there. There could be potentially some SLAs and SLA violation, violation is definitely one of the KPIs which we can control. And another interesting KPIs which are relevant for support is time to first reaction, time to full resolution, which means like how much time a, a customer uh, waited until um, uh, um, uh, he, would, he or she would get like an initial response to the ticket. This is time to first reaction and time to full resolution is what is the time uh, until the, the ticket is completely resolved and not reopened. Um, and this is all the different KPIs uh, for the support you could potentially use. <clears throat> they are very simple to understand and supported by a majority of tooling providers. However, here again, the same the same challenges as we've seen before. If we see it on a on a company on a, on, a, on a corporate level for across all of the customers, we will definitely come in the majority of the cases to the statistically significant numbers where we could reason about number of open tickets, average, or, or, or basic number of SLA violations, and median time to first reaction. However, if we split it on individual customer level, especially by smaller customers, that could be potentially a challenge, which could lead to higher variance, right? So the numbers will just jump uh, from very, very positive to very, very negative, uh, which could potentially like become a, a rather a noise to the customer health scores and actually an information which is actionable uh, and useful. <clears throat> and last but not least, uh, this is one of the, um, I'd say KPIs, which we saw not very frequently corrected, connect, uh, collected or analyzed systematically, uh, but it's actually a CSM sentiment. 
and why we're, we're taking it in our list. And the reason for this, so some sentiment is just an assessment of the customer success about the customers that they are working with. And this assessment <clears throat> can be done just manually. So, you know, similar to the NPS score, where a user of uh, application or a service is asked uh, how likely he or she would recommend it, it's the same, but was the way around. So this customer success person who's responsible for this account, that account is asked, what do they think? What is the current state of the customer relationship? Is the customer happy, not very happy, maybe somewhere in the middle? And uh, this, this same sentiment is actually uh, very frequently underlooked because it actually takes some time to collect and also um, um, uh, have, have some definitely some overhead. However, the advantage is, is it's very easy to understand uh, and easy to collect with a time consistency. Reason for this, uh, for any collection of a sentiment of a customer, you'll send an email and then maybe the open rate will be 50% and click rate will be another 50%. So at the end of the day, you'll have maybe out of 100 users, you will get in the best case, I don't know, 25 to 30 responses. Here, we're talking about company internal organization policy. So we will definitely have received, uh, we'll definitely will receive more responses. Now, however, definitely the drawback here is that <clears throat> this, it, the, 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 this sentiment can be sentiment can be subjective, right? Maybe uh, just customer success managers was not in a good mood, or something actually happened uh, at home, so that the responses will be rather negative than positive, uh, which could cause potentially, uh, which could cause potentially some negative, let's say, customer scoring as well as if the team is fluctuating and changing, then the inconsistency can appear. However, uh, you, we need to remember that this is actually a de facto assessment anyway of any customer health score. So even if customer health score says like, okay, this customer is red, but the CSM is pretty sure this customer is doing great. And he actually, he or she spoke to the customer and customer said, we're doing great. Then the CSM sentiment internally will actually overrule any formula you have. So it's actually a very, very important metric also to collect. So just going back, going closer to the end of our um, webinar today, <clears throat> just to recap uh, what we've learned, there are definitely some nice approaches and nice KPIs you can collect. However, most of the times or very frequently, we will find with a low quality of data and low statistical relevance, especially on smaller accounts, uh, especially uh, in the beginning of, of, of let's say, establishing a, a proper customer success uh, health scoring in a customer health success structures. The second is, it's technically um, tricky sometimes to calculate the KPIs which we mentioned. Um, if the number of open tickets can be like uh, somehow easy to uh, get from the uh, user interface, it can be tricky to implement other more complex KPIs because of the formulas involved in it. And then um, sometimes, or very frequently, we have like more KPIs, which we could potentially handle uh, alone from the support t or ticketing system or from product, product information system. We can get a lot of data. And uh, here we need to understand like, hey, what data is actually relevant for my, for my case, for my product, for my company, and what can actually be ignored. Therefore, this is like still a lot of challenges and a lot of approaches here. And last but not least, we should not forget that basically the data integration represents a huge challenge here. We have seen a lot of uh, our customers, we have seen a lot of also interview partners which are still fighting with this data integration. And uh, due to this limit on data quality and statistical relevance, the customer health scoring actually doesn't work at all, uh, which is very, very sad. <clears throat> However, there are some modern approaches in creating a customer health scoring which is moving away from, let's say, standardized uh, fixed formula on, and fixed weights, but using advanced artificial intelligence um, models, also known as machine learning models, which are actually can handle and can solve majority of challenges with existing approaches. So the ML models are less tolerant on low data quality and are missing data which is a huge win that we could, you could start with machine, with machine learning model very, very fast and actually train the machine model 
on, on no data, actually, because based on the sentiment of CSMs, which is easy to collect. Second, it's easy, it's actually automatically adopt over time because the models and the weights in the model formula are typically fixed, which makes it very complicated to change it over time. So you need to remember to reevaluate your decisions that you made in building your customer health model. And this, uh, and, and machine model actually automatically adjusted in the time. The third is actually, um, which is wonderful criteria and wonderful feature of ML model. <clears throat> the ML models can automatically adjust themselves to identify the most valuable for your case characteristics in the data that you provide. So actually without you picking this and that and this KPI or like listening to this presentation looks like top five, you just actually dump all of the KPIs which you have in all of your systems into, into the machine learning model. The machine learning model will pick the most relevant for them, which is providing the most, um, the biggest amount of information compared to the least, least amount of noise in the data. And uh, last but not least, the machine learning models are continuously training. This is a, this is a pretty, pretty much like the newest uh, research in this area. So the, automatic, like auto, also called, also called auto ML, the machine learning models, when fed with the data about the decisions and about the acceptance of the data about the decisions, can close the loop and automatically learn and relearn the new things based on the actions in, 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 in your customer's base, in your customer base, also in your company and CSMs, which gives them huge advantages compared to the standardized approach. And, uh, this is actually what we are doing at RevOS. So RevOS is the first no-code artificial intelligence platform for sales marketing and customer success. So we're actually solving the connectivity uh, challenges to collect maximum number of amounts of data in very, very short time. So we have predefined connectors to CRMs, to data warehouse, product support systems. And I mean, also we accept CCs, you know, you can just give us the data and then we'll just dump it into the system. We have a number of predefined models for lead scoring, customer health scoring, pipeline scoring, forecasting, expansion, and sales forecasting, many, many different models. And we actually have an experts here in, in, in our team to, to work with this, with this data. Um, and what we also provide is an engagement modules. These are the things to really make the model works. Yeah? The model, which is somewhere running somewhere in, in the cloud, which is theoretical, and may not actually be tangible for your use cases, we deploy it into your working environment and making sure that you can use the data, use the decisions, use the predictions right into the places where you work in your CRM and your CSM and your support systems. And last but not least, we're closing the loop with automatic activity capture to continuously train and improve the models. So once you start using the artificial, uh, the machine learning model for your, for example, customer health scoring, it will be coming better and better um, over the time so that you will not need to, you know, manually adjust the weights or maybe just uh, contribute it, uh, configure it new data sources and new um, uh, weighted formulas to make sure that your model becomes relevant or remains relevant to the changes with your business. Um, I'm a bit over the time, uh, but this is basically it, what we, what, uh, we wanted to present today and we would be happy to hear uh, any questions. Okay. So it looks like there's like a lot of information and uh, uh, so far there was no, no questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, guys. And uh, it was great, it was great to presenting, to, happy to present it to you today. And looking forward to then chat with you after the webinar and we will also distribute the slides uh, together with our webinar page. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.